Would life be possible without coffee? Would our modern society cease to function if we could no longer drink our dark, piping hot caffeine elixir? Well, the history of coffee is a fascinating one. One connected to mystical Muslim Sufis, French revolutionaries, slaves, soldiers, constipation, and alcohol-soaked toddlers. So, what is the history of coffee? Well, let's find out. Our story begins in a dark, scary period of human history, the pre cafazine The ancient land of Ethiopia may be the cradle of all humankind, but more importantly, it is the birthplace of coffee. Here in the mountainous rainforests near Kaffa, coffee has grown wild for millennia. We don't exactly know when humans first started consuming coffee, but the most popular story involves some very happy goats. One afternoon, an Ethiopian goat herder named Kaldi noticed his goats hopping about excitedly. Some were even dancing. He saw the goats eating leaves and berries from a small shrub. Kaldi, now curious, decided to eat some himself. Soon his heart was pounding, his mind was racing, and he was dancing with his goats. The magical, energetic properties of caffeine had been discovered. Now, this is just a story. Kaldi probably wasn't the first coffee addict. The world's first coffee lovers were probably the Oromo people. They've probably been chewing on coffee beans and leaves for thousands of years. They would crush it up and mix it with fat to make ancient coffee power bars. Coffee leapt across the Red Sea with Oromo slaves sometime in the mid 15th century to the port city of Mocha in modern day Yemen. There, the Sufi mystics found that the drink could keep them awake during their long nighttime prayers. It was in Yemen that coffee made from roasted beans is first documented. The most popular species of coffee was born here, Coffea Arabica, which now makes up about 60% of the world coffee supply. They named the drink Kawa, the Arabic word for wine, from which the word coffee probably comes from. By the end of the 15th century, coffee had spread throughout the Islamic world, and the cafe was soon born. Cafes found a niche in Islamic society. Devout Muslims can't really just head down to the pub. So, cafes provided the Islamic world with a secular social space outside the home, where Muslim men could engage in lively conversation about politics, business, and religion. Coffee soon became so important that in Turkey, the inability to provide coffee beans was grounds for divorce. But some rulers thought people were having a bit too much fun at the cafes. Now, their actual concern was that people were discussing politics and informing themselves, which rulers tend not to like. Coffee would find itself banned in Mecca and Constantinople for a time during the 15 and 1600s. But coffee drinking continued in secret until the bans were lifted. While Muslims were sipping away in their fancy cafes, to the west of them lay a small, divided and violent backwater called Europe. Since coffee and tea hadn't reached Europe yet and the drinking water was sometimes unsafe, beer was Europe's favourite beverage. A professor of medicine in 1551 stated, People subsist more on this drink than they do on food. On average, every man, woman and child in England drank over 350 litres of beer per year up to the 17th century, while Germans were putting away 400 to 600 litres. Europe wobbled about under this depressive and confusing alcoholic haze, until Dutch, Venetians and Italian merchants began importing coffee in the 17th century and a new, stimulating social space opened up. Oddly enough, it was firstly in England that café culture captivated Europeans. London's first café opened in 1652. By 1700, there were over 2,000 cafés in London. Called Penny Universities because for the price of a cup of coffee, you could sit there and listen to the country's most intelligent people chat. You see, pubs were not the safest places to discuss politics or religion. People were drunk or armed, usually drunk and armed, whereas cafes provided a sober and caffeine-enhanced environment for debate and discussion, which was exactly why King Charles II tried to ban them in 1675, before quickly being forced to back down. English cafes would foster early capitalism. Some of the world's largest businesses, like Lloyd's of London, the East India Company and the London Stock Exchange, all began as cafes. Now, not everyone loved coffee though, especially women who were excluded from cafes. In 1674, they complained. We find of late a very sensible decay of the true old English vigour, our gallants being every way so Frenchified. 
we can attribute to nothing more than the excessive use of that newfangled, abominable, heathenish liquor called coffee, which has so eunuched our husbands, and spend their money all for a little, base, black, thick, nasty, bitter, stinking, nauseous puddle water. We humbly pray that henceforth the drinking coffee may on severe penalties be forbidden and instead thereof lusty nappy beer and cock ale be recommended to general use. Cock ale, by the way, is beer with a dead rooster in it. The link to their full six page complaint is linked below and I highly recommend you go read it for a good laugh. By 1777, coffee was so popular in Prussia that Friedrich the Great complained, my people must drink beer. His majesty was brought up on beer and so were his ancestors. In 1781, he banned citizens roasting coffee and created a secret anti-coffee police force nicknamed Coffee Smellers to sniff out illegal coffee dealers. But like elsewhere, the bans were soon reversed. The Viennese soon became Europe's next big coffee lovers. Their great idea was adding sugar and milk to coffee, creating the Capuzzo, named after the colour of a capuchin monk's robe, which became known in Italian as a cappuccino. In 1669, a Turkish ambassador introduced Paris to coffee. The French originally didn't like the taste, but no matter how much they disliked the stuff, they were deeply moved by its unique ability to deeply move them. Or in the words of Paludanus, to breaketh wind and openeth any stopping. Soon French doctors were prescribing coffee enemas. Now, the bells weren't the only thing coffee was stimulating in France. It also tickled the mind. Soon after the 1689 opening of the stylish Café Procope, it attracted the likes of Diderot, Rousseau, Voltaire and Benjamin Franklin. Soon, thousands of Parisian cafés were fueling the Enlightenment. On July 12, 1789, Camille Desmoulins delivered a passionate speech from a café table and whipped the crowd up into an anti-aristocracy rage. Two days later, they stormed the Bastille, igniting the French Revolution. Over in British North America, Washington, Hamilton and Jefferson used cafés as the headquarters of the American Revolution. The now caffeine-addicted Europeans were desperate to find coffee supplies not controlled by the Ottoman Turks. In the mid-17th century, the Dutch brought coffee from India to grow in Ceylon, Java, Sumatra and across Southeast Asia. Dutch colonists would drown Europe in Asian coffee using enslaved natives. In 1860, Dutch civil servant Edward Dowes Decker quit in disgust and wrote the novel Max Havelaar, which documented the terror taking place on Java and attacked Dutch landowners who grew rich from the poverty of others. In 1720, Gabriel Mathieu de Clieu brought a coffee plant to the colony of Martinique during a harrowing journey where his ship was attacked by pirates, storms and dehydration. During the trip, he shared his daily ration of half a cup of water with the tiny coffee plant. His sacrifice paid off though. Within 50 years, there were 18 million coffee trees on the island. The offspring of his plant are now responsible for a huge part of the world's coffee supply. William Muckers wrote about coffee, Wherever it has been introduced, it has spelled revolution. It has been the world's most radical drink in that its function has always been to make people think. And when the people begin to think, they become dangerous to tyrants. The irony was that while coffee was seen as helping to free Europe and the US from tyrants, it brought tyranny elsewhere. The clue almost sacrificed his life for his tiny coffee plant, but he never actually thought of harvesting it himself. Slaves from Africa would do that. By the 1780s, 60% of all the coffee consumed in Europe came from the tiny French colony of Saint-Domingue, harvested by over 500,000 African slaves. So the coffee that nourished Voltaire and the Enlightenment involved the most barbaric form of forced labour. J.H.B. de Saint-Pierre noted while travelling in the Caribbean in 1773, I do not know if coffee and sugar are essential to the happiness of Europe, but I know well that these two products have accounted for the unhappiness of two great regions of the world. America has been depopulated so as to have land on which to plant them, and Africa has been depopulated so as to have the people to cultivate them. The 1789 French Revolution inspired the slaves in Saint-Domingue to rebel and demand their own freedom, creating the slave-free nation of Haiti in 1804. But when it comes to the quantity of slaves though, Brazil takes the awful cake. Just in the first half of the 19th century, 1.5 million African slaves were shipped here to work on coffee plantations known as Latifundia, which made coffee men some of the wealthiest in Brazil. This led to Brazil keeping slavery longer than any other nation in the Western Hemisphere. It only outlawed it in 1888. 
Brazil conquered the coffee world. It produced such an extraordinary amount that it helped increase demand by making coffee cheap enough for members of North America and Europe's working class. Brazil democratized coffee through slavery. By the 1920s, Brazil was producing 80% of the world's coffee. It's been the world's leading coffee producer for over 150 years, and in 2017, it produced 2.5 million tons. That's a third of the global coffee supply. Coffee made modern Brazil, but at an enormous cost. Brazil was, according to Eduardo Galeano, ruined by a plant whose destructive form of cultivation left forests raised, natural reserves exhausted, and general decadence in its wake. As Brazil conquered the coffee world, Central America followed in its footsteps. The history of Guatemala is an example of what happened to the entire region. After gaining independence from Spain, the government turned to coffee cultivation as a potential source of wealth. Prime coffee growing lands were, however, occupied by indigenous peoples such as the Maya. This land was then confiscated by rich coffee growers. Then indigenous peoples were forced to work on the new massive coffee plantations. They were watched over by an enormous army. Jeffrey Page wrote in Coffee and Power, Guatemala had so many soldiers that it resembled a penal colony because it was a penal colony based on forced labor. This system dominated Central America. The only local exception was Costa Rica. You see, most of Costa Rica's indigenous peoples had been killed off centuries before by Spanish settlers and disease. So when Costa Ricans began growing coffee in the 1830s, they couldn't run those large slave plantations like Brazil and Guatemala. Now, they still enslaved some, but there just weren't that many. Instead, small farming families working together did the physical labor. By not relying on slave labor, Costa Rica was able to develop into a more united and stable nation. In 1906, while in Guatemala, George Washington, an oddly named Belgian, mixed refined coffee crystals with water to brew coffee instantly. Now, he wasn't the first to invent instant coffee, but he was the first to mass produce it. His invention came just in time for the First World War and its massive demand for instant coffees. In 1918, the US Army bought the entire George Washington instant coffee output. By the time the war ended, the US Army was preparing over 40 million cups of coffee daily. So let's head back to Asia for a bit. In 1869, an outbreak of leaf rust caused by the fungus Hamilia vastrix began. It first appeared in British-controlled Ceylon and wiped out all of their coffee Arabica plants, along with Indias, Javas, Sumatras, and the rest of Southeast Asia's. Many had to switch to growing tea and turned Britain into a tea-drinking nation. This started a panicked search for other species of coffee. Enter Coffea canifora, better known as Robusta. Native to Central Africa and discovered just as the fungus ruined Asian crops, it turned out to be disease resistant, twice as caffeinated as Arabica, and grew essentially anywhere in the coffee belt. Its only disadvantage was that Robusta beans, well, they taste like arse. They need to be blended with some Arabica to be drinkable. Then in 1938, Nestle launched Nescafe, a new and improved powdered instant coffee, and took over the global instant coffee market. The taste of instant coffee was so bad that it didn't really matter if you used cheap Robusta beans leading to a Jeep instant coffee industry boom in the post-World War II period. Today, Robusta makes up about 40% of global coffee production. Competing with instant coffees were the Italians. In 1884, Angelo Moriondo invented the first espresso machine, which was then improved upon in 1901 by Luigi Bezzera. This new espresso was made by forcing almost boiling water under high pressure through very fine coffee grounds. Before this, coffee would take up to five minutes to brew, Espresso cut this down to 30 seconds and produced a much more consistent cup. By the 1930s, espresso was in cafes all over Europe and the United States. The speed of espresso and espresso-made drinks made it the ideal beverage to grab before work and during newly invented coffee breaks. It became the perfect drug to fuel the rise of capitalism. Now much of the world orders their coffee in Italian. Espresso, cappuccino, latte, macchiato. Sure, even the Americano, a drink invented for American soldiers, is ordered in Italian. All remnants of Italy's espresso revolution. Except frappuccino. That's not a word. That's nonsense. The espresso revolution soon moved into the home and fueled the creation of dozens of espresso spurting household appliances. Within the coffee industry up until now, all the focus had been on creating the perfect and or cheapest cup. But the beans that produced people's lattes were harvested by near-starving peasants. 
So Fairtrade International began in 1997 to try and guarantee a certain fair standard for products such as coffee. To be labelled fair trade, the production chain must follow fair trade standards, such as workers, environmental and children's rights, along with the payment of the fair trade minimum price. Fair trade coffee sales have soared since its launch, but it has garnered its fair share of critics. It's not a perfect system, but it has done much to improve some lives and working conditions. Caffeine is now the world's most popular drug, and coffee is its most popular agent. We now brew about 1.4 billion cups of coffee every day. From a mystical Muslim drink, to colonial commodity, to revolutionary beverage and the fuel of capitalism, this small African bean has transformed our world. Coffee is one of the many foods that has changed human history. If you'd like to know more about how food has transformed our world, I'd recommend you check out 